Hello everyone who has joined. Um, we welcome you all. Uh, we are very happy to be back from our uh, summer break. Uh, we, um, we are starting today with, uh, with Professor Simpson. Uh, we will wait a couple of more um, minutes for other people to register and join. And I uh, welcome you all and thank you all for being here. Okay, maybe I will just start by uh, giving you some um, information regarding the talk. So we will have um, we will have um, more or less one hour talk, and then after the talk we have a, we will have a Q and A session. We still have some spots available, so I would uh, really um, encourage you to join us after the talk. Um, if you want to just drop a line in the chat and then I will contact you back with a link to the room zoom so that you can join us afterwards. Um, whenever you have a question, uh, you can use your chat, the chat, or you can use, um, the ask a question, um, icon as well. And you can vote for a question as well, if there's one which is already there. Um, okay. So let's maybe just wait some more minutes, at least so that the people who has registered enter the, the room. Okay, so I will guess I, I guess I will start by introducing uh, Professor Simpson. So we are very happy to have Professor Simpson with us today. Um, with the time difference, it's not so easy to do this, um, this um, meetings, but we are very happy that we managed to have one time that works at least for a part of the world. <laughs> um, but we are uh, streaming also in YouTube. So for the ones who cannot join, uh, we will be happy to share the link. Um, so Professor Simpson really does not need any introduction. But uh, so Professor did his uh, PhD on locust feeding physiology in University of London. And then he continued his, his research in the University of Oxford for, for, for many years. 
uh, after which he went back to Australia. Uh, he's now the academic director of Charles Perkins Center. And the center aims at uh, advancing the knowledge on how to act on um, many human conditions, which include obesity, diabetes, and uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, he also has a, group, a research group, which is the Precision Nutrition Group. And uh, he, in his own words, the group's emphasis is uh, bottom-up because they are interested in, in which lower level uh, processes leads to uh, higher uh, level outcomes. And uh, his approach is uh, very multidisciplinary and he combines a mix of theory and experiment and he focuses on individual organisms' behavior. So it's fantastic that Professor Simpson does not really shy away from using a variety of different organisms and techniques to ask really relevant questions. And um, he has worked with species which go from insects, mice, fish, birds, several animals, and this includes humans. And he also uses approaches that go from analysis of behavior, uh, metabolic, digestive physiology, mathematical modeling, you name it. So. Um, with this, he has contributed immensely to our understanding on how organisms behave to reach nutritional homeostasis and the implications of these behaviors uh, and nutrient availability uh, through diet to uh, several life history traits. And together with his co colleague, David Rubenheimer, Professor Simpson has developed an integrative modeling framework uh, for nutrition, which we all know as a geometric framework. And um, it has been applied to a variety of organisms, and this goes from slime molds to humans. Um, and, and in addition to this, um, uh, Stephen's research on, on the locust has led to uh, an understanding on how um, uh, the swarming of the locusts links the chemical events in the brain of individual insects to uh, the landscape scale mass migration. So we are very, very happy to have Professor Simpson here today. We welcome him uh, at our series and we are really looking forward to hearing from him and from what he will uh, tell us about today. Um, so as I was telling you, you can um, engage in, in further discussions after, after the talk through uh, our Q&A session in the room Zoom, in the Zoom room. And uh, just let me know if you want to join afterwards. And if you can, uh, if you want to ask questions, you can use the chat or ask a question icon uh, below. So Steve, uh, the stage is yours and I will turn off my mic. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much. Peter. That was, that was a lovely, lovely introduction. It was longer than my talk, but uh, I shall now share my screen, if I may. And yes, you're entirely right. It's the evening here um, after seven o'clock in the evening. So I, I wish you all a good morning and um, I'll head on with sharing the screen. Um, which has disappeared. What? Should take a couple of minutes. It okay. could take a couple of minutes. So maybe we should just wait a bit. <clears throat> yeah, it should, yeah, be, should fine. be fine. There it is. There it is. <laughs> we don't see it yet. There we go. There we go. Okay. Fantastic. How's that? How's that? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So if ZT, you turn off your microphone so we don't have that echo. Thank you so much. Um, right. So what I was going to do this evening is take you all this, this morning in your time. I, I'm going to take you through a journey that sits underneath an overarching theme, which reflects something that we've been doing at the Charles Perkins Center with colleagues all around the world, actually. And it's this notion that the biology of aging shares the same 
fundamental metabolic substrate and physiological substrate, as do many of the chronic diseases of aging, which are in epidemic proportion around the world prior to COVID, and in fact are, are interacting with COVID in rather unpleasant ways. And these, um, this underlying substrate is uh, fundamentally shaped by nutrition. This the metabolic substrate itself comprises a whole series of nutrient sensing or nutrient responsing, uh, responsive pathways. And that if you were able to use diet in a way to manipulate those pathways, the aim is that you could, for the price of a single intervention, solve multiple problems in health at the same time, um, including healthy aging. Now, underlying that is what I've called for this talk, the protein paradox. And let me begin by explaining what I mean by that. Now, it's well known, certainly increasingly well known over the last decade in the biology of aging, that reducing protein intake and that of key amino acids extends lifespan, particularly during midlife and in early late life. As you get very old, you require more protein, but reduction in protein intake during that midlife period has health and longevity benefits. However, countermanding that, due to a, a powerful protein appetite, if you reduce protein in the diet, that leads to increased food intake, which, if that's accompanying um, increased energy intake, is going to promote obesity which will shorten lifespan. So you've got these two countermanding components, two roles that protein plays, and that together um, provides what I'm gonna call the protein paradox. And what I'm gonna do this evening in this talk is to introduce four key pieces of the puzzle. I'll take you through four separate entities or, or, or semi-stories, small stories, and then I'm going to put them together in a thought model for the modern food environment. And having done that, along the way, I will have led you on to the second in uh, a little dual talk. I'm giving the first talk and the second one, David Robenheimer will give in October in your series. So I hope to be setting him up and taking a more mechanistic uh, approach to the set of issues that he will deal with in a more ecological way. Now there's David playing with the trunk of an elephant, but you'll get to see him in October. Now the first piece concerns the now very well understood phenomenon of nutrient specific appetites. It seems to be virtually universal that animals, and not just animals, it extends as we'll see in a minute beyond animals, have specific appetites for key nutrients, the three macronutrients, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, but also at least two of the micronutrients, sodium and calcium. And that these appetites uh, are universal, they're found across species, and that in appropriate food environments, they help animals to balance their diet. Now, the mechanisms underlying these appetites, um, you know very well, of course, because Carlos and his team um, at Champalamode have done some of the most beautiful work in understanding nutri nutrient-specific appetites, particularly um, in Drosophila. But as I say, these appetites have evolved to guide animals to attain nutrients ba nutrient balance, at least under appropriate nutritional circumstances. And so we could, we could come up with a virtually endless list of examples. I've shown you three here. One is the, um, the case of the German cockroach, which has this extraordinary ability um, to, to target its intake both of protein and carbohydrate. Those two nutrient appetites interact and the animal, um, as a result, virtually acts like a nutrient-seeking missile. And you can perturb its nutrition give it appropriate food choices, and it will make the right nutritional decisions to maintain its nutrient um, intake target in both those dimensions, protein and carbohydrate. Up on the top right is um, Stella the Chakma baboon, which 
I think David will tell you more about, but this is a glorious example of tracking a single baboon eating more than 90 different food items over a period of 30 days. Those food items being incredibly various in their composition and their nature. And apparently the animal looks as if it's just selecting randomly from its food environment, but when you trace it back to its intake of protein and non-protein energy, you'll see this remarkable stability and in intake. What it's doing is tracking a 20% protein um, of total energy diet unerringly. And the bottom example um, is one of my favorites. Uh, that's the slime mold. And this is a piece of work uh, that Audrey Dusator, uh, when she was with me in Sydney, um, we did together looking at the capability of this brainless syncytial organism to make nutritional um, decisions that were wise. And so what Audrey did was take bits of slime mold and put them in Petri dishes containing agar. Uh, the agar was comprised of different ratios and concentrations of protein and carbohydrate, systematically varied across a large number of those ratios and concentrations. She then measured the growth of the slime molds over the next 24 hours. And then you can map that as a response landscape. And what you'll see here is this heat map, and you'll see quite a few of these as we go through this talk, which shows the growth of the slime mold um, from its maximum levels in the dark red down to its minimal levels in the deep blue. And what you'll notice here is that they grew biggest on the two to one mix of protein to carbohydrate. Now, what we then did was give the organisms a choice of, in this case, 11, I think it's 11, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, no, it's fewer than that in that case. Um, in this case, this experiment had eight different combinations. And you'll see here a blob placed in the middle of the dish, and then a range of, of little disks of, of um, agar, nutrient agar, containing a different ratio of protein to carbohydrate. The optimal one you'll see there is in red. And this is what the slime mold did, filmed over the next 24 hours, as it grows out, exploring its environment. And by 24 hours, it's colonized, located and colonized the optimal food. That's a remarkable uh, achievement. That's essentially nutritional genius. And this organism has no brain. It has no um, limbs. And all it is is a, a pile of uh, nuclei wrapped together in a single enveloping um, cell membrane. So that begs a big question, of course, if a brainless slime mold can balance its diet precisely, why can't we? And that's a question that David and I have spent a long time trying to answer. And we've brought all that together in our most recent book together. And um, David will develop um, the idea a little bit further in his talk. So we'll leave that question hanging. It's not because we lack the capability to do this. It's because of the way that biology works in the modern environment. In particular, Nutrient-specific appetites under certain circumstances don't work together to help organisms balance their diet. Rather, in imbalanced nutritional environments, they're forced to compete with one another. And I'm just going to give you the sort of theoretical basis for that now. It's a rather simple set of ideas. What we're going to consider is a two-dimensional nutrient space in which protein is on the x-axis and non-protein energy in the form of carbohydrates and fats is on the y-axis. Now, over a given period of time, integrated over that period, there'll be an optimal combination of those two, protein and non-protein energy, um, and we'll call that the intake target. And an optimal diet, a balanced diet, is one which will allow the organism um, to attain that target simultaneously. It can reach the target point um, and get the appropriate amount of protein and non-protein energy as at the target. But what happens if it's provided with a nutritional environment that's imbalanced? Let's say 
the dotted green line here is the only diet available to the organism. Well, that's too high in non-protein relative to protein energy. The animal can eat that diet, but it'll only head along that trajectory and therefore never reach its intake target. It's going to have to compromise and the nature of that compromise could be, for example, that it stops when it gets to that yellow dot, it's eaten the target level of non-protein energy, but eaten too little protein, or it could keep going until it gets the right amount of protein, but will have grossly exceeded its requirements for non-protein energy and total, um, total calories. Or it could count calories and go to the isocaloric intake, albeit that the calories are coming from a different blend of protein and carbohydrate in this dietary environment. Well, what the animal actually does is an empirical question, and we've answered that question in many, many different species over the years, and in various, but by no means all species, the common outcome is to prioritize protein. And what that means is that the animal will continue to consume a given diet until it gets to the point where it's attained its protein target and then it'll pretty much stop. And what that means, of course, is that it will under consume energy on higher than target percent protein diets and it will over consume energy on lower than optimal protein percent diets. And you can see that same um, data set essentially transformed in this little insert here, where you have the percent of protein in the diet on the x-axis and total energy um, eaten, the red dotted line. And you'll see that goes up steeply, according to a power law, in fact, as you diminish the percent protein in the diet. To maintain protein intake consistent, the bottom dotted line, the animal has to eat increasingly more total food and energy to achieve that as protein becomes diluted in the diet, up to some point when the whole homeostatic system will collapse if it gets too dilute. Now, that's a theoretical um, outcome, a very simple graphical model. Here's some real data that show animals doing exactly that. This is um, a paper, one of the ones that I first saw, I think, when I visited Champanamo a few years ago, when Kristen Mirth was still at the um, Gulbenkian. And that was a, a lovely study um, that Caveo and she did looking at larval drosophila. And you'll see here protein versus um, non-protein energy, which in this case is carbohydrate on the left. And you'll see that what's happening here is that the animals are lining up their protein intake is consistent, their total energy intake is varying hugely to maintain consistency of protein intake, such that as you dilute protein, um, total energy goes shooting up. So there's an example in um, larval drosophila. David will give you examples too from wild primates, two of them, um, one orangutans in Borneo and another spider monkeys in Bolivia, I've shown you some data here, which show in both cases really remarkable protein, um, the, the prioritization of protein, um, the leverage of total energy intake made to in, in, as a result of maintaining protein intake quite so um, consistently in both cases. And the other primate that we've discovered over the years shows the same pattern um, is the human ourselves. So there are many data sets I could show you now um, from, as in this case, a compilation of data across multiple trials collected by other people, experimental trials, to our own uh, experimental studies in Sydney um, or in Jamaica. And essentially what happens in humans is that if you vary the proportion of protein in the diet from about 10 to 40 percent or thereabouts, then we track um, total energy intake tracks such as is required to maintain stability of protein intake. It's not entirely 100% um, maintained homeostatically, but protein intake is regulated far more strongly 
under circumstances when you manipulate the percentage of protein to non-protein energy in the diet than is total energy intake. Um, and the evidence for this now we think is, is pretty overwhelming. Um, we brought the evidence together along with some of the um, points that required clarification that have emerged since we first published the idea in 2005 um, in a paper towards the end of last year, and you can read more about it there. But the argument is that this phenomenon that we call protein leverage, we believe has been uh, a major contributor to the um, evolution of the obesity epidemic um, across the world in the last um, 50 or 60 years. Okay, so that's the first piece of the puzzle, nutrient-specific appetites. They, they're there, they interact, they either collaborate to maintain nutrient balance or in imbalanced environments, they compete. And in ourselves, the human species, protein is prioritized and can leverage um, food and total energy intake. The second piece of the puzzle is that you can't consider protein or indeed any nutrient on its own. And indeed, one variable at a time thinking has pervaded much of nutrition science since the beginning and has really in many cases led us astray. And the reason, of course, is that by concentrating on a single nutrient, you miss the fact that nutrients interact with one another. And we've spent quite a lot of time, at least over the last oh, 15 years, demonstrating the significance of macronutrient interactions, initially in insects and then most recently um, in rodents. And I'm going to take us back to this study here, which was published first in 2014, um, and I'm going to build upon it through the rest of the talk. Now, the study involved taking um, more than 800 C57 black six mice um, of both sexes and placing them onto one of 30 experimental diets that differed systematically in the ratio of the three macronutrients, protein, carbohydrate, and fat, um, as well as their total energy content. So to give you a feel for the design, here's, here's a, a simplex, a mixture simplex, showing carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And each of those dots within that pink um, triangle indicate the experimental mixtures. And those mixtures were provided at one of three calorie densities, low, medium, or high, to mice from weaning across the life course. Now, the very lowest 5% protein diets, there were five of those, um, low energy, low protein diets. At very early on, the mice just weren't able to grow. They, they were eating substantially more, but they couldn't keep up, they couldn't grow, and they had to be removed from the study. And the remaining 25 diets have been used for the analyses that we've published ever since. Now, here's cutting to the chase. Here's a really significant um, graph from that first paper, which maps the longevity effects, the median lifespan of the mice in the study, according to their intakes of protein versus carbohydrate. Now, fat, the third dimension, is collapsed in this model. And what you'll see here is that the surface attains its highest elevation, the dark red area, in low protein, high carbohydrate intakes. And it was its lowest elevation, the shortest median lifespans in the high protein, low carbohydrate um, intakes. And that surface there reflects the topology, the way in which the animal responds on average um, to the macronutrient balance in the diet. Low protein, high carbohydrate, prolonged life, high protein, um, low carbohydrate, shortened lifespan. Now, you can then um, track that back to actual lifespans. You can repeat it. We've repeated it, and Linda Partridge's lab have repeated key treatments, and it's a very robust finding. 
as you dilute protein in the diet, you prolong lifespan. Now, you can then start as we've done. Um, this is Alistair Senior, a colleague um, at the Charles Perkins Center. And Alistair has used a, a really novel life table approach to then start tracing the age specific mortality throughout the life course. So rather than taking an overall measure like median or maximal lifespan, what he's done is to use life table approaches to map age specific mortality in this same data set over time and showed that this low protein, high carbohydrate diet was most beneficial for longevity and minimize risk of mortality in midlife. When the mice got very old, their protein requirements went up and there are good physiological reasons for that. Earlier in life during reproduction, there was a higher requirement for protein as well. And that provides the uh, appearance at least of a trade-off between reproduction and longevity in relation to being on a fixed diet. And Alistair's in the process actually of um, finalizing, we've just got it back from its first review, um, the use of these same life table approaches to global human nutrition supply data. And we're seeing the same signature that we see in the mouse study um, at a global level um, in relation to macronutrient balance. And what about humans um, more generally? Well, it's well known, of course, that the longest lived populations on the planet have a low protein, high carbohydrate, high healthy carbohydrate, hence high fiber diet. Um, the Okinawan um, Japanese are very well known, of course, in that regard. Tsumane from lowland Bolivia are another beautiful example. Now, these aren't experimental data, they're observational, but they're certainly in accordance with what we know about um, the, well, the other mammal model system that we've worked with, the mouse. More than that, in the mouse, we're able to show that the mechanisms are related to the fundamental um, processes involved in aging biology. So just as you can map uh, an outcome, a life history outcome like longevity onto nutrient intakes, you can do the same thing um, for macronutrient intakes. So what we have here is protein versus carbohydrate intake and these heat maps for, in this case, mitochondrial function, um, IGF-1 levels, mTOR activation, telomere lengths. And what you'll see is, let's take telomere lengths as an example. Um, low protein, high carbohydrate diet uh, animals had the longest, these are hepatic cell telomere lengths. Um, they had the lowest mTOR activation, mTOR being a canonical pathway that's known to be involved not only in protein synthesis, but also um, in enhancing the rate of aging. Um, IGF-1, likewise, is highest on a high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet um, and low on a low-protein, high-carb diet and so on. When it comes to mTOR activation, what we were able to show is that if you mapped um, mTOR activation and, and the mTOR pathways as a function of circulating um, indicators of protein intake and carbohydrate intake, namely um, circulating levels of branch chain amino acids and glucose, then you'll see a very clear surface. As the um, BCAA to glucose ratio increased, the rate of activation of mTOR increased as well. And that's a pro-aging outcome. So you can start to relate the life history outcome, how long the animal lives, to some of the fundamental biology about which um, we have some deep understanding in relation to the biology of aging. Now that takes us um, seamlessly to piece three, which is the role of branch chain amino acids. And those are of course, leucine, isoleucine and valine. Now we know they activate mTOR um, and they're critical for growth and reproduction. But they're also a better predictor 
of metabolic disease in the future than all genetic markers combined when it comes both to humans and mice. So your um, circulating levels of BCAAs will predict your likelihood of becoming type 2 diabetic within the next um, decade uh, with a seven-fold higher probability than any of the genetic markers um, that we know about. So the story is that a high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet leads to increased circulating branched-chain amino acids. That in turn results in activation of the standard um, pro-aging pathways, a reduction or a degradation in, in mid and late life cardiometabolic health and a reduction in lifespan. But as you will have seen by looking at that previous set of surfaces, that only happens if you're under a low carbohydrate background. So if you elevate branched chain amino acids under a high carbohydrate background, the suggestion is that you don't have the deleterious um, impacts ultimately on lifespan. So here's some data from Paula Juracic in Linda Partridge's lab, which we combined in uh, a paper last year in Nature Metabolism, which showed that if you put mice on a, um, a pear-fed arrangement where they either had a 23% protein diet, which is a standard protein diet for mouse, or a low protein 6% diet, they lived longer on the 6% diet and it didn't matter whether you loaded that up with free branch chain amino acids, they still lived longer. So under a, a high carbohydrate background um, in this instance, there was no deleterious consequence from ingesting more BCAAs than you should on an otherwise high carb, low protein diet. So it isn't just BCAAs. So Samantha solon Beat, um, working with a, a series of members of the lab, Devin Vahl was another shown here. Um, Samantha embarked on this, uh, another similarly heroic study to her previous one in cell metabolism, this time taking more than 800 mice and asking the question, how does varying the ratio of dietary BCAAs actually influence health and aging against a, a high carbohydrate background? And so the experiment involved taking 12 week old black six mice, placing them on a standard 19% um, protein, 63% carbohydrate diet, fixed fat, and within the protein complement, varying the proportion of branched chain amino acids to other amino acids such that they were either um, control 100% or double 200% or a half or a fifth. Maintaining the animals um, for either the rest of their lives or 15 months, which was the point when they were culled as in the previous study, and then measuring uh, markers of sort of mid to late life metabolic health and ultimately lifespan. Now, the long and short of it was that when it came to lifespan, then there was a reduction on the highest BCAA, the 200% BCAA diet, but it was only about 10%. It was a pretty modest um, um, reduction in lifespan. You'll see that in this graph here. But more than that, it wasn't associated at all with activation of any of the standard pro-aging nutrient sensing pathways. mTOR, IGF-1, for example, were entirely unaffected by being on a 200% BCAA diet. Rather, the longevity um, decline of about 10% was completely linked to obesity. And the animals on the high BCAA diets ended up fabulously fat. You'll see them here. Look at that little one on the bottom left. It's like a little football. And as you titrated BCAAs, you'll see that the animals became leaner. So there was something about being on the high BCAA diet that drove a massively increased adiposity, 
And that something was hyperphagia. So the animals simply ate more food as you increase the ratio of branched chain amino acids to other amino acids in the protein complement in their diet. And in fact, if you plot using our sort of bi-coordinate geometry um, approach again, this time you've got branched chain amino acids on the y-axis and the rest, non-branched chain amino acids on the x-axis, what you'll notice is that accumulating um, intakes over, over 15 months, what you're seeing is that the animals are tending to line up um, on some components in the non-branched chain amino acid axis. It's a little bit reminiscent of protein leverage, as we saw earlier, sustaining or regulating intake of some element within the non-branched chain component. What was that? We didn't know. So we could take these data as they existed and start to ask the question, could we see any signatures within the data that indicated which of the amino acids um, in this grouping here might be being regulated by the mice and hence leveraging or driving total food intake and causing obesity? Well, if you take the essential amino acids and you actually measure their intakes in the mice and look for the ones that changed least that gives you a clue as to what it might be that the animals are trying to regulate and it transpired that there were three um, threonine methionine and tryptophan that remained remarkably stable in their intake as a result of the mice changing their total food intake on these different diets. By contrast, obviously the branch chain amino acids, but also um, these other ones were unstable in their intake. They varied hugely, either going up or going down. It was those three, threonine, methionine and tryptophan that remained consistent. More than that, if you then um, took the 200% BCAA diet and renormalized the ratio with respect to each of those three amino acids in that by simply adding double of each of threonine, methionine and tryptophan, you could then ask the question, did that abrogate the increased food intake um, that's seen in the 200% BCAA diet? And the answer to that was yes, it did, at least partially in the case of tryptophan being added back um, alone or threonine being added back alone, but there was no effect of adding double methionine um, on its own. So there was something it seemed about tryptophan and threonine that was important and that the animals are paying some heed to in regulating their food intake. That then translated into central and peripheral ap appetite signaling. And you can see that um, in the hypothalamus, where some of the standard appetite signaling hormones are radically influenced um, by BCAA going up, for example, in the case of NPY on the 200% um, BCAA diet. You could also see it in plasma metabolomics where increasing the ratio of branch chain to non-branch chain amino acids had a profound impact on metabolites of tryptophan catabolism. So tryptophan catabolism went down. That impacted in two ways, one through the kynurenine pathway, um, and that's involved ultimately in NAD production, which is known to be um, implicated, of course, in aging. And the other is through blocking serotonin and reducing um, peripheral levels in plasma of serotonin markedly. And serotonin is known to be linked to increased food intake. The same was true in the brain. And when Elena Bagley working with us um, did some patch clamp recordings from dorsal raphe neurons, um, she found really profound impacts on um, brain um, serotonin signaling. So, for example, if you 
um, in a patch clamp, you can evoke inhibitory postsynaptic currents in um, a control BCAA 100% um, brain, and you can block that with a receptor agonist, antagonist, sorry. Um, but if you looked at the BCAA 200 animals, they were totally um, serotonergically depleted. Um, and so you had very few neurons that were responsive um, to um, evoking inhibitory postsynaptic currents. And it transpires, we think, that what's happening, um, and this is pretty well known, that BCAAs compete with tryptophan for transport across the blood-brain barrier via the LAT1 transporter. And what that means is that you get less tryptophan into the brain, you get less serotonin, and you get increased food intake. And you should predict that if you were to take um, your mouse, 200 fed mouse and put it on Prozac, you should reduce that hyperphagia. Um, and indeed, that's what we found. So it seems that there's a double burden of branch chain amino acids. If you've got a diet that's got a high level, a level of branch chain amino acids, particularly relative to other amino acids, you'll end up with elevated levels of BCAAs in circulation, you'll activate the standing pro-aging pathways, you'll degrade late, late life health and you'll reduce lifespan, but only when the percent protein is high and the carbohydrate levels are commensurately low. By contrast, if you have a high BCAA, low non-BCAA ratio, even with a high carbohydrate background, what you're going to do there is leverage food and energy intake, you'll end up driving obesity, and that will um, reduce lifespan uh, to the extent that obesity can and will in many other circumstances. And that will be especially the case when the percent protein in the diet um, is low as a result of protein leverage. Now, you might ask the question, you've probably been thinking it throughout, what about the type of carbohydrate? Well, that turns out to be extremely important as well, but that's another story. Uh, in fact, if I come back in six months or a year's time, I could tell you that story. Um, Gibran Wali in the lab has just collected what I think is one of the most beautiful data sets um, I've seen. Um, certainly, it, it helps to resolve many of the current controversies around carbohydrates and their nature in relation um, to longevity, obesity, diabetes, and so forth. Um, I'll give you a clue. The answer comes down to macronutrient interactions as well as the quality of those macronutrients. And here's the final piece of the puzzle, and that's the discovery um, not the discovery of FGF21, that's been known for some while, but Chris Morrison and his group's discovery that it's a key um, signaling hormone in relation to protein appetite. Now, Chris um, uh, and his team, Lager et al., were the, uh, that was the, the, the first paper in 2014, um, started to show this. We were um, moved as a result of reading Chris's work and meeting with him um, to map circulating FGF21 in our mice from our large dietary study. And lo and behold, what you see is that FGF21, which is um, derived largely from liver, goes into circulation and acts um, in the brain in multiple ways, that, that goes steeply upwards in circulation as um, intake of protein drops below a threshold level. It's a marker of low protein status, particularly elevated when you've got low protein coupled with high carbohydrate. But the principal driver you can see here is intake of protein. Now, that's really interesting because it means that you can have very high levels of circulating FGF21 under two completely different circumstances. One up here, where protein leverage is driving the animals to be hyperphagic 
um, they're protein deprived, but they're and they're having to eat more food and more energy in this case, in, in, in the form of carbohydrates and fats to get sufficient protein and they're hyperphagic and they're obese. And um, that comes with various consequences as we know. But on the other hand, they can be low in protein and low in non-protein energy and still have elevated FGF21. And can FGF21 resolve those two circumstances and in what way can it do so? So the first thing to, to try and understand was whether you can use FGF21 to shift the macro sele uh, macronutrient selection of the mouse. And the answer to that is yes, you can. So what, what I've shown here are some unpublished data of ours where we used subcutaneous mini pump implantation to, to perfuse FGF21 at physiological levels peripherally and then allowed the mice the opportunity to select between a high protein, a 35% protein, and a low protein, a 5% protein diet. And what you see is that the animals are normally, if they're either unperfused or saline perfused, they'll be tracking a, a, a percent protein diet, which is around this level. And if you um, perfuse them, then they'll be, they, they select a higher protein intake. So that was in peripheral perfusion and Crystal Hill and um, Chris Morrison's group, we helped work with them on this project. But here, what they did was ICV injection um, into the lateral ventricle and got the same thing. If you perfuse um, FGF21 into the animal, it will shift its macronutrient selection to increase protein intake, but not change its total energy intake or its um, carbohydrate or non-protein energy intake. So central and peripheral FGF21 increase protein specific appetite. But if you look at the influence of FGF21 on um, energy expenditure, you get a very different story. And this reflects those two different circumstances I was talking about a little bit earlier. So what we have here um, are measures in a metabolic cage of energy expenditure. These are um, averaged over, a, a, I think it's 10 or more mice um, kept separately in metabolic cages. And what we have here is the energy expenditure going up and down throughout the, the day, um, as you would expect it, um, both on a high energy and a low energy diet with saline perfusion peripherally. If you perfuse FGF21, however, then the high energy fed animals increase their energy expenditure and the low energy animals decrease their energy expenditure. So FGF21 is having a context dependent influence over the expenditure of energy by the animal. So if it's in a state of hyperphagia, FGF21 switches on protein appetite and energy expenditure. If it's on a low protein diet, but it's short of calories, then it's um, causing the animal to conserve energy while switching on the protein appetite, a diversion um, a quite distinct um, um, diversion in the outcome as a result of the action of the same compound. And as it happens, that doesn't seem to have anything um, at all to do with differences in locomotor activity. It's energy expenditure um, in other ways through, um, particularly we think up um, um, the, the increase in UCP1 and um, diet, diet, essentially diet-induced thermogenesis. So let's bring it all together. I've given you these four pieces, and what we're now going to try and do is put them together in a thought model in the final minute of the talk. So let's, let's say that we have the organism. We're going to talk about people in this, in this last slide. Um, we've got people in a condition of low protein status. 
reduced dietary protein, increased protein requirements. There's a mismatch between them. For whatever reason, um, the organism is in a low protein status. What does that do? It leads to the production, the elevated expression of FGF21 and production in circulation. What that does is turn on the protein appetite and in appropriate food environments that would lead us to select higher protein foods and that would then redress that protein um, imbalance, that protein shortage. But in environments where for whatever reason that doesn't happen, instead what that protein appetite does is through protein leverage cause us to eat more food to get enough protein. And I've shown you how that works. That's going to lead to increased energy intake if the dilution of protein in the food supply is occasioned by having more calories in the form of non-protein energy. Now, FGF21 will try and get rid of those excess calories by switching on increased energy expenditure. But at some point, that system will break down either through prolonged um, exposure to a low protein, high energy diet, or as we've seen through some imbalance within the protein complement, for example, a high, pro, uh, a high ratio of BCAAs to tryptophan, and that will lead to obesity. And what's the sort of food environment within which that will happen? Well, that's the food environment that we've constructed over the last um, 50 years. And David will tell us that story um, when he speaks in a month's time. Those food environments have subverted our fundamental appetite control systems. High palatability, cheap, superabundant, ultra processed foods uh, are really distracting us away from having appropriate food selection. And that's exacerbating um, the protein feedback that we've just um, elaborated there. So what we need to gain the midlife, particularly mid and early late, late life benefits of restricting protein in, intake is to have our protein leverage response um, countermanded by not involving increased energy intake. So hunger for protein driving increased food intake needn't be and shouldn't be accompanied by increased energy intake in an environment where um, there is sufficient bulk in the food and that bulk isn't in the form of calories to drive um, um, energy um, excess. And in fact, FGF21 under those uh, circumstances we might predict would result in conservation of energy rather than um, excess expenditure of energy. Um, and either way, that combination, um, we would think through the canonical pathways we've talked about would lead to a, an extension in lifespan and an improvement in midlife health. And to do that, and this is um, the final point, you require a low energy, high fiber diet. And that brings us right back to the original traditional human food environment. So I'm gonna stop there. I, I've given you, I hope, something to think about. We've been through a series of different components. I've tried to put them together at the very end. Um, there are many people that I, I need to thank. You've seen some of them along the way. David, you'll hear about more um, in, in another month's time. And I think at that point, um, with thanks to you for listening, um, I'll draw it to a close. Thank you. What a lovely talk. Um, thank you so much for your talk, uh, Professor Simpson. Um, so we have one question here. I'm going to start by asking. Um, question we have here. Um, does specific amount of protein evoke the society or the appetite for food is determined by reaching that specific amount of protein in the diet? Um, I think the question is, can we differentiate between 
a satiety or an appetite. Uh, that's a, a difference. That's actually, I mean, uh, that's a, that's I'm getting the echo again. So <laughs> thank you, Zeta. So we'll just have to do that because I, I, I end up listening to myself and I listen to, I talk to myself enough. Um, so very good question. The, the, the fundamental um, question, I think, is, is appetite um, a unitary phenomenon or is it instead a series of separate appetites? And, and I think the latter is, is um, I would argue, is, is clearly demonstrated that appetite, it should be appetites rather than sing, um, the singular. Um, but ultimately, those appetites have to come together through some final behavioural common part as colleague David McFarland once called it. And what that means is that these different appetites through their interactions ultimately have to guide the animal to determine how much it eats and which foods it chooses. And at that point, there may well be some sort of common satiety hormones in that final common path. But even then, I wonder, actually, because um, many of the interactions that we see in feeding behavior are really very nutrient specific. So the extent to which certain foods are selected over others is can be explained in terms of either their direct nutritional composition or associated cues that the animal has learned to associate with specific nutrient state um, and whether or not there is such a thing as an overarching hunger or appetite, I'm beginning really seriously to doubt. I think these specific appetites are actually what's driving um, and their interactions are, are what are driving um, food intake, feeding behavior um, in pretty well all organisms. Now, I know that um, sort of uh, sort of disagrees with, I suppose is too strong a word, um, with the view of the world which is purely driven by calories. Um, and I, I think there's actually, the more I look at it and the more we've understood, um, the less way um, calories or energy per se has over both physiology and ultimately selection of food. Um, now, I know I, some colleagues will disagree violently with that, but um, I think the, the behavioral evidence is particularly strong that that's the case. Okay, um, so we have a couple of more questions. Um, first here, sorry if I missed it, but why is obesity in the mice on high carb, low protein diet not associated with increased mortality and low lifespan? Aha, uh, well spotted. So you can separate, and we did that in mice, you can separate healthy from unhealthy obesity. and. Um, <clears throat> that happens on, on a low protein, high carbohydrate diet, you can get a mouse really quite fat and it will actually uh, be metabolically healthier and live longer. Um, with the imbalance of amino acids, we could drive obesity to such a degree that you did see um, a bad outcome. They, they were 10% less long lived. But in the original study, the longest lived mice were actually some of the fattest. And the question is, why is that? How, how can they be fat and healthy? And the answer we think lay in a series of um, associated um, phenomena. The microbiome was transformed on a low protein, high carbohydrate diet. Um, the FGF21 levels um, are elevated and it has um, a, a, a multitude of what are considered to be metabolically helpful effects as well as switching on protein appetite. But it was absolutely the case that if you dial down protein um, and in mice, which don't show very strong protein leverage, actually, they show really quite weak relative to us protein leverage, you can drive up food intake and energy intake. But if that is because of fat rather than carbohydrate, you end up with worse outcomes than if it's carbohydrate. Then you have healthier, longer lived mice. 
If it's a low protein, high fat diet, then you have hyperphagic, obese, unhealthy mice. So by you can quite literally dial up um, protein, fat, and carbohydrates, and you can dissociate obesity, um, insulin resistance, and various other um, uh, fibrosis in the liver. You can either have a fatty liver, which is fibrotic or not, um, and all manner of different outcomes can be changed in ways that um, would lead you to say, well, that, that's healthy obesity in a mouse. Um, or that's unhealthy obesity in the mouse, and it's driven by the macronutrient balance, and, and we've shown that very clearly, actually. Fantastic. Okay, so we have another question here from Carlos. We are observing that the impact of nutrients on human physiology is very different among individuals. To which extent is the case for nutrient interactions like protein leverage? And to which extent would one need to personalize dietary recommendations? Uh, again, an another very important question. I, um, I think there are, well, clearly there are, um, there are differences between individuals. If you take something as fundamental as what's the protein target, um, if the protein target is set higher, then that is going to put the individual at greater risk of um, obesity in a, a low protein Western food environment. Um, and there are reasons why the protein target is higher in some individuals than others. Some of them are going to be genetic. Some of them are going to um, are going to reflect populations, um, which is genetic, but it'll be populations ancestry with respect to their diet over millennia. Others are going to be as a result of lifestyle. So if you've been anabolic for a period, for example, you've been um, a, you know, a, a, an elite athlete or a bodybuilder for a period, you're going to set your protein target higher. And when you stop using that protein anabolically, and you've still got a high protein target and your energy needs drop, then you're going to be super at risk of obesity um, in a Western food environment. And I think at least the anecdotal evidence supports that. And one of the really exciting things we're just discovering right now is that you can set the protein target of a newborn mouse by manipulating the diet of its mother and that by um, shifting the protein target, you shift the risk that the animal becomes metabolically unhealthy and obese in um, a food environment. And we've, we've got um, um, Therese Freer at the moment doing her PhD on that, and the, the data are really quite remarkable. Um, so yes, there's, there's, there's substantial variation. Uh, it varies across the life course, um, but I think there's a real risk with throwing the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to precision nutrition. Um, after all, you know, a, 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 a fly, a mouse, a human have very different nutritional requirements um, in relation to their diet. And um, within species, there are differences between populations. There are differences because all of these are heritable traits. And there are differences with during the life course and with epigenetic effects, et cetera, et cetera. How much of that do you have to take account of at an individual level in optimizing diet? Um, I, I think there's a risk that we're over egging that particular case. And I must say um, the notion of using um, machine learning and abundant data collected from wearable devices and implanted dev devices um, to optimize glucose excursions in an individual, I, I'm, I'm, I find that fundamentally um, uninteresting as a biologist in wanting to understand how things work. And I don't think it's really necessary, to be honest. Um, I think we'd be better off having a a healthier diet which was tailored in a in a, a more generic way to 
our particular circumstances rather than necessarily having to go all the way down to um, being as precise as um, as I think some would argue at the moment. So that, that again, sorry, I've probably been um, um, offensive to some of my colleagues, but I I, I really don't I, I don't necessarily see that precision uh, nutrition in the way that it's sometimes being promoted at the moment is the way to go. Certainly not for improving the health of populations um, or, or ultimately fixing the global food supply. I think they're the sorts of things that we should be concentrating on more. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. Uh, do you think that central and also peripheral serot serotonin signaling can also integrate at additional aspects of the feeding behavior? That, uh, I'd love I'd to love know. To I, I don't know the answer to that. It, it's you can you can dissociate the two, and that you can have and obviously um, a high proportion of the total serotonin production occurs in the gut. So. Um, the way in which peripheral signals are integrated, including serotonergic ones, um, with central um, signals, I, I don't know enough to give you a decent answer to that, but it's a really good question. And I think more generally, the question of how you integrate peripheral and central signals is, is fundamentally important and something I've had an interest in for, for many years. Um, but, but good question. I don't know the answer. Okay, our final question. How would an imbalanced protein intake lead to protein leverage in a foraging scenario with sparse protein sources? Um, how would protein... It, if you're in a foraging circumstance, your options are defined by the foods that are available. In, in the natural world, if you're foraging in a natural environment. And the, there are two ways that you're, um, you can end up being subject to protein leverage driving overconsumption of energy, for example. Uh, one is that there just aren't appropriate high protein food items. So you're, you're kind of stuck on um, uh, on a lower protein diet and therefore you have to eat more to get enough. Um, and uh, David will explain examples of that in, in wild primates where at certain times of the year um, there are an abundance of different types of food and, and seasonally that happens or, or, or stochastically that happens and the animal's stuck. Um, the, the other circumstance is when you're led astray um, even though you've got, uh, let's say, a cornucopia of different food options available with every possible combination of nutrients, you still end up eating the wrong balance and protein leverage will drive you to eat too much energy. And, and that's the story of the modern food environment. And, and again, I'll leave that for David to talk about in his talk. Um, you're muted now. Okay, now it's on. Fantastic talk, Steve. Thank, thank you so much for um, your time and to answer the, the questions. Um, we are now moving to the Zoom room now to continue uh, this discussion for maybe um, 50 more minutes or so. Uh, so whoever wants to join, please... Uh, drop me a message through the, the chat. Um, uh, Professor, I think I sent you the link, so you just uh, yeah, need yeah, to, sorry, sorry. to follow the link. Uh, okay. Thank you all okay. for being here. Thank you for the great talk. And I hope you have a nice uh, start of the week. See you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Okay. okay, so you okay, can so all log in. Log Okay, let me just leave here.